nature lives in our in our bones in our blood this is where we come from and i don't think we i don't think we give children enough of that and they love it and often it's it's taken away we put them in boxes and we say the bell's going to ring you can't you can't go out in the rain in the rain Hello and welcome to Tell Me Your Story. We are delighted you are here with us today. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Wendy. Her journey into teaching was accidental and happily she discovered Montessori who believed that nature and children were the best mentors. Her publications feature a dynamic blend of systems theory, student innovation and eclectic prose. Her doctorate identifies early childhood, elementary, and high school students, and the soul-stretching surprises inherent in following the child. Some highlights of Dr. Wendy's career include mounting her students' nature-themed murals at the University of Toronto, spearheading a national program to bring Montessori's vision to 365 in-service teachers in Iran and helping bring Montessori into the public in Yellowknife. Wendy is co-founder of two experimental theater companies and the internationally renowned Sustainability Frontiers. Dr. Wendy, if I may call you Dr. Wendy, welcome. Thanks, Gay. And be here. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, and so we always like to start off with tell me your story. So if you would, wouldn't mind, Dr. Wendy, let's hear it. Okay. Um, so I guess if I go back to what kind of made me, number one, my mom, who just she's an artist and environmentalist she was a nurse in the second world war on the front um just a gutsy creative lady and and basically when i was the kid we'd drive around on the bicycle and collect pieces of wood from building sites around the growing metropolis of saskatoon and we'd play with things and she'd ask me questions like, she'd say, okay, let's imagine that I come from the, the past and I don't know what all these things are. Why don't you take me through the house and explain? So I would explain to her what a toaster was. And, you know, it was just like imagination. She was wonderful. Um, and then I fell in love with horses and I met this guy, Uncle Russ McCory. We called him Uncle Russ because he collected kids and we go to the racetrack and rescue horses off the track that were going to be either, you know, sent away for whatever. Um, and he would throw me up and I'll show you a picture. <laughs> He'd throw me up on these thoroughbreds. Wow. These poor skinny thoroughbreds that got rescued. So he hasn't even gained weight yet. And he gave us hockey helmets because um, he was a hockey coach. He coached, he discovered Gordie Howe. And he'd say, okay, hun, take him over that fence there. And gradually, I just, the risk was wonderful. Um, I only broke my nose once. At, but being in nature was just the most molding, modeling, and, and having these animal mentors was wonderful. So I take that into the classroom. Um, anyway, that's the beginning. Then my dad who's this wonderful thinker. And I'll show you a picture too that he sent me of a guy walking along a string, but he's holding the string in front of him. It's like a tightrope, but as he holds it, he extends it and he's walking along it. And that's kind of what dad encouraged. And when he saw my Montessori classroom for the first time, he said, I never would have wanted to go back to school before I saw this room, so. Is that enough for starters? You know what, Dr. Wendy, that's a wonderful segue into my next question. So thank you for the lead in and <laughs> let me continue. In your bio, you mentioned that you fell into teaching 
accidentally. And I was hoping that you could let us know a little bit more about that. So a whole big teaching question. Okay, so so accidents. And I, I don't know, I, I think so much of my life and a lot of people I've talked to are, uh, you know, a series of happy accidents. So I decided that I wanted to go to Europe after university. And I went and traveled around and lived in Greece for a while. And then I, I got a job at um, a city farm in Kentish Town, which is kind of a, a really poor area of London, England. And they had horses and they were using the old coal stables from the, you know, the coal pon ponies would shunt the coal in the Victorian age. They had horses there and they would bring in kids. Um, and the kids from the area acted like mentors. Um, so the, they would bring in buses of kids who had learning challenges and, you know, different abilities. And I worked there and I loved it, but they had a, a farm, a city farm and a fun art bus and a theater in the West End, an almost free theater. So the creativity was just boom, boom. I got back to Canada and I thought, okay, I'll start a theater group at the barn where I'm working. So I got a bunch of teenagers, we wrote a musical and we had, we planned a journey, a nine day journey. We we're gonna ride to Lakefield from King City, but we would put our horses at different farms on the way. And we had all the farmers lined up. They said, as long as you show us your musical, you can stay for free. And just a week before we were supposed to go, a woman bought a pony at an auction and it had um, strangles, which is equine distemper, hugely contagious, like gross. The barn was shut down, quarantined. My friend said, I'm going to the Montessori Institute to see about being a Montessori teacher. Do you want to go? And I said, eh, I guess so. And I fell in love they showed us a film of children in nature, working outside, working inside, using their hands. Um, and it was brilliant. And that's how I fell into it. I see. And again, you are, you know, Dr. Wendy, I gotta tell you, you're segueing into every question and you're making it easy for me. So it's a brilliant thing. My next question is, is now, what were, why were you drawn to Maria Montessori? and her pioneering techniques in education. What was it that you felt connected to in those techniques? I, I, that's a great question. And if anybody wants to dive into that, there's a fabulous movie, it's Italian, and you can get the subtitles. Um, and it's called, I think it's just called Maria Montessori. And I can send you the link, but it's wonderful because it shows her as an inventor. And so when we started to study her, um, first of all, here's this woman in a man's world, her father disowned her because he said, you can't go, you can't be a doctor, you're a woman. And so she became actually the valedictorian of their year because she was so respected. She got a job um, with children who were incarcerated and at that time it wasn't just like children were strapped to beds and you know if they had no parents they'd find themselves in institutions it was just horrendous so she rescued these children and she realized that they needed stimulation for their minds to grow um, and so she she created these wonderful materials uh, first she she just started with showing them how to wash their hands and you know, grow things. And then she realized that, hey, I'm gonna cut out letters out of uh, something tactile. And they started spontaneously putting the letters together. She taught them the sounds. So they put the letters together and they, they taught themselves how to write. And she says, and this is amazing. She says, you should teach writing before you teach reading. I was brought up in the old way, you know, Cat, C, Jane, Ron, blah, blah, blah. And when I was my first year of teaching, I didn't believe it. But this little girl who'd done nothing all year went away to Nova Scotia, came back. She was four 
and I saw her go to the mat and she took these movable letters and she made this poem and she, she said, come and look. And I went, oh my gosh, it was spelled all wonky, but who cares? And the poem was waves splash in laughter. So big because I like them. And then she wrote it down in her child way with this beautiful picture of a clam shell dancing on the waves. And man, was I ever sold. I thought, we, we are facilitators. And that's what Montessori says. We don't teach. We, we provide materials for children to teach themselves. So on that would be, um, I just wanted to, on, on that again, <laughs> on that note, following the child. So they're the lead and you as a, as you've just mentioned, a facilitator, then compile the programs, which again is going to lead me into my next question, but I just want to make sure that that's where I'm at. Is that, is that the basic <laughs> foundation? <laughs> So yeah, in a nutshell. In a nutshell, thank you. <laughs> the curriculum is is incredibly rich. Like children are playing with um, beautiful blocks. It's, she believed in natural materials too, not plastics. But um, three year olds are making the binomial and trinomial theorem, and I never realized that those theorems are actually abstractions of materials that you can actually make. Um, and so they're putting these blocks together and putting, making them into cubes, just like a game. We never explained that to them at that age. She was a math, she was brilliant. So it's not sort of, I don't want to give the idea that it's like, come in, la la la. It's these beautiful materials that allow the child through materialized abstractions to discover things in the world that in a regular system, like, I didn't care about the binomial theorem until I became a Montessorian. It's like, who cares? But, oh my God, this is a real thing. Wow, that's amazing. So how do you express your creativity in designing lessons for your classroom? And perhaps you could provide us with some samples of, of your, you know, how you create your lesson plan or what your lessons are in your classroom. Uh, so that's thank, that's a great question. Um, usually I just sit down in a circle and say, okay, um, let's think about history. How do we want to approach this? And so we come up, and this is partly a Montessori idea from a wonderful farm school in Burton, Ohio, where you do it through dramatis persona. So you'll, you'll research your family and go, oh, so-and-so, uncle, uncle. Well, there was a boy who, his grandfather had just died from um, a lung condition that he got when he was a young man firefighting before they had masks and stuff. He just died. So this boy said, I'm gonna do grandpa. And everybody took different relatives. Oh, there was one girl who's, I think grandmother, great-grandmother, hid in a closet for three days during the Greek, um, the, the Greek Cypriot War, was it? Anyway, it was just, so they would dress up, so they'd research it, and every, every week they share stories. So then the final presentation, they dress up, they research um, it, and they speak in I, the subjective. So I am so, so, so when this little boy did, he wasn't so little, he was, this is for junior high. He read the letter that his grandfather had wrote to his, had written to his grandmother the night he met her and everybody started crying. So it's basically, let's get a theme. Let's see how we want to approach it. So it's, it's creative, but it's also democratic. And anytime you can get food, so the feast, so creating food, or nature, going out into nature, a lot of the times we'll, and I'll show you some images. Some of the images can be shared because there are no faces, but we go to the farm. I, I love horses, so I run a program called Project Centaur. And when I'm teaching adults, I do the same thing. I say, well, how, how can you do this in a creative, collaborative way? so that you're modeling 
inside the process you want your students to follow too. I think I did ask you this earlier, but how different is it teaching adults than it is to teach children in this Montessori method? Or do you apply the Montessori method to adults as well as children? I know children, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, if you, let's say if you, if we were in a class together, a Montessori class, um, part of it, part of the whole process is how to be how to learn to invent so a lot of the times we'll say okay um we've showed you some of the basic um sort of the methods and the reasons the philosophy and that's really strong because it's you know children have sensitive periods at different they grow in different stages and i just want to say too that Montessori believed in three-year age increments so not teaching by litter. So we don't do grade one, grade two, grade three, because you want a mixture of ages. So the older children are becoming teachers and modeling for the younger ones. And there's freedom of movement, freedom of discussion, but also there's a structure of different themes and different materials that allow children to go at their own speed. For, so for adults, we have this, this thing called the great lesson, which teaches history from the first pew, the beginning, right through to now. And it involves different science experiments and story. But then the students for the exam have to recreate the great lesson as a collective, but they have to introduce mythologies that relate to, for instance, the warming and cooling of elements or, um, the, you know, the first, the big, the big booming of light or the, the age of volcanoes. So it's an, it's an amalgamation of mythology and science. And oh my gosh, I, when I first say this to them, they go, uh, as you do, right? Right. Oh, as, as I did, as I reacted exactly that, I'm like, what? <laughs> This but, is what I'd be learning as an adult. Oh my gosh. <laughs> fantastic. It's oh. fantastic for sure. <laughs> so how does the environment inspire you? I mean, you know, I know coming from Saskatchewan and you're outdoors with the trees and, and I hope you like my sunflowers. These were for you. Um, oh, I love them. Thank you. How, how is it? How does the environment, the outdoors, the nature inspire you what 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 does it how does it drive you i'd like to hear that okay. okay okay so um i think just being in it as a kid that was the best the freedom of you know going out into the prairie and you know rescuing deer we'd find deer legs and wrap them in our mom's favorite pillowcases and bury them you know that kind of so that was a visceral thing um but then like i i i quit teaching um for seven years and i did our, i i became i got involved in theater by the kids the kids wanted to do plays and then i got more and more into theater so i started to develop this method of um, drama where you involve yourself you immerse yourself in nature without sound. So we do four hour improvs in Toronto, downtown Toronto, a bunch of actors get together and we got grants from the Canada Council and we go into nature and just respond to, and we'd end up on Toronto Island and things would happen. We did it up here in Damascus too, where chickadees would come and land on us. And if you take away prose, if you take away language, I don't know it's an, another voice speaks and so i got i got really excited about nature as not just a great place to be or a great place to go but an actual mentor that this nature lives in our in our bones in our blood this is where we come from and i don't think we i don't think we give children enough of that and they love it and often it's it's taken away. We put them in boxes and we say, 
bell's going to ring. You can't you can't go out in the rain in the rain, etc. But um, yeah, I I mean they do forest walks. And forest bathing is a big thing now. You know, you yeah. go into the forest and I, I have to comment on nature have as the uh, another voice. I I have to quote another voice speaks. That was brilliant because I I think that we aren't given enough nature, we aren't in nature enough, and I just had to agree with you. Uh, that's amazing quote. I'm going to quote you on that. I'm going to use that. Another <laughs> voice speaks. That's nature. So we're just getting ready to wrap up. I've got one last question for you, Dr. Wendy, and I'm going to quote Simon Sinek. What is your why? It's kind of a a loaded question. We know what you do. We know how you do it. What we'd like to know, what I'd like if you could to share with our audience is the why. I mean, we have pieced together your love of nature and your love of horses and your love of outside and your, your fascination with the Montessori method. And But the in you, the why, if you could. That's, that's, that's an interesting that's interesting we always do this who what where when why when we're doing drama sure but but to say what is your what is your like i have a bunch of whys probably and isn't it funny that why w-h-y and w-i-s-e are you know what are they and no homonyms Hom saint wise wise yes homonyms? i think yeah. it's homonyms we'll have to look that up after we go off air but yeah i think so that is a very interesting point so back to you dr wendy what is your why i think my why is trying to fit <laughs> trying to fit on the continuum of what's happening in the world now um and I think now that I'm getting to be a gray haired woman, it's different than it was 10, 20 years ago, because I think, holy cow, how much time do I have here? And what's happening beyond me? And how am I responsible? How am I part of this? Because I look out and I see global warming pandemics, and I still see people using a ton of plastic i'm sure i do i drive a car you know and and i say well how can i how can i be a, a, a good why on this continuum and contribute to a world that's going to you know thomas berry says we're going through this hopefully we're going to move into an ecozoic age where humanity realizes that we are so intricately tied to nature that if we don't again listen to this voice we're going to have a really depleted future the world will always survive but our children this is the thing you know when when i was a kid we didn't have to worry about mass extinctions and stuff so i guess that my why is how do i take what i've learned and this love of nature and make it more vibrant and relevant for children and adults the people that i interact with and through maybe through writing through teaching through through modeling somehow that is a great finisher so I would love to say thank you to you. Fascinating words coming from you today. I really enjoyed listening to your answers to our questions. Uh, Tell me your story hopes to provide, you know, a glimpse into people who do what you do, teach and do art and work with children. And we are extremely grateful for you to have spent your time with us today. So I'd like to say thank you. I'd like to say continue the good work. And um, to our audience, I'd like to say thank you so much for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you next time. And tell you, tell me your story. Goodbye for Thanks. now. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Kainaz. Lovely.